worship his holy name. Oh, you holy Lord. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Lord, we bless you tonight. The sun comes up. It's a new day, darling. It's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever comes before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord oh my soul oh, oh my soul worship his holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. You may be seated. Lord bless our children. Amen. As they slip out of here in their little costumes and stuff and get sugared up, whatever's going on back there. Hallelujah. You got your Bibles? Genesis and then the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Genesis and Hebrews. Who makes the coffee? He does. Hebrews. I mean, Genesis chapter 1. Mm-hmm. Thank you for watching us on HolyWild.tv and tuning in. I know many of you stayed home tonight because of either Halloween or you're dealing with uh, the World Series, the sixth game. And I will say it's Sunday night. In, in that little RV I was in, it was full of, uh, of young men screaming and hollering. How many saw Sunday night's game? Did you watch that game? That game was crazy, man. I mean, that was the craziest game. I thought last week, that Tuesday night, that second game was crazy. But, uh, you know, I just, it, and it's fun because, it's, and I don't mean this mean, but Houston, our Astros are a bunch of no-names. Other than Altuve, who's, because he's five foot six, has gotten so much press and does so well, most folk don't know anybody until we got Verlander. You know, it was like, who are these guys? But they jail, they have fun. To me, that's the way church ought to be. Mm-hmm. You know, just having fun, enjoying life, uh, you know, handling the depressed times and and, and, and crying with one another, then rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's a big deal. Uh, tonight I want to talk to you about faith will get us home. When I say home, I'm talking about home base. I'm talking about the things that are home here and the home there. I did a funeral Sunday evening of a 91-year-old lady who had tremendous life, tremendous legacy, had tremendous uh, kids. I, when I was around them, I could tell what kind of character that mother was by being around her children. It doesn't take much to do that when you're around certain people. And, and uh when it was over with, of course, I get a lot of accolades about how I do things when I do funerals. But one of the things I, I did say there that was a little bit different from others is I stand on this book. And this book tells me that to serve God here, to love him here, and to have faith here will get me home. I've never been to heaven. Bill and Henry were baseball friends, and they love baseball more than anything. As they got older, they said, you wonder, I wonder if there's baseball in, he- in heaven. And so Bill and Henry had this idea, well, if one of us dies, the other one will come back and let the other one know. Well, Bill died in an accident a little bit early in life and wasn't expecting. And, and, a, and a few years later, Henry was woke up as Bill actually entered into his room. He looked at this ghostly figure of Bill, and he said, Bill, what's up? And he said, man, i got some news for you. He said, there's baseball in heaven. Oh, man, Henry got so excited. He said, but I also got some more news for you. You're batting tomorrow. Amen. So I, I really don't know how heaven's going to be and what it's going to be like, and you know, but, but as much joy as we've had here on this earth, and that's what I share with people a lot of times at a, at a memorial service, is this book is all I got. I, I've studied uh, Buddhism. I've studied, uh, uh, I know a little bit about um, uh, Muslims. I know a little bit about uh, atheism and, and, and some of the other isms in life, but I can tell you something. The only thing I have faith in is that book and what that book tells me. And if I have faith, as the Scripture says, that, and I will make it home. And so you got to have faith to get you home. Genesis 1-1, if you need a little baseball in the Bible, here it is. It says, in the beginning. 
okay? It was a big inning, and then God created the heavens and the earth, okay? So I just want to throw that at you if you just needed that. That's just a little uh, get you through to tonight, all right? Hebrews 11, 1, 2 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Again, it's not what we see that's important. It's what we do not see and believe for. This is what the ancients were commanded for. When it says ancients, it's talking about Moses. It's talking about Abraham. It's talking about David. It's talking about Ruth. It's talking about those of the Old Testament that, that didn't have a, a Jesus to follow, didn't see all of those miracles of Elijah and Elisha. These are those ancients. Verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. How are you? You can't come to God unless you first believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Again, when you seek the head of God, you get the hand of God. So if you go after Him, say this with me. When I believe God, I please God. One more time. When I believe God, I please God. So it's believing and not doubting. It's, 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 it's particularly, and I don't care who you are, I've never seen anybody that's faced the end of life and not had a little bit of intrepidation or fear in there because they, they've never been to the other side. So faith has to rise up over that fear. You've got to believe God that things are going to be all right. I'm going to tell you, life was pretty easy when I was by myself. But when you start having family, you've got kids and grandkids, your faith has to arise. You've got to start really believing God for them as you're moving through it. So I'm going to talk to you about the basis of faith. First base. Everybody say first base. first base. First base is revelation. Revelation is a promise revealed. God revealing his choice for your life, ministry, or business. I often will use it this way. The light goes on. You know, you get into church and you get revelation. Or you hear the word preach. You get a revelation. of it. God tells you who your, your spouse is going to be. Or God tells you something about a business venture. And you start to do that. God mentions to you something about a ministry. You've been doing something in life. And then this light goes on. And you realize that revelation calls it. It can be revealed in your spirit as an inner witness or through his word. But something rises up in you. says, you know, I, God has given me a revelation to pray over people. To believe for, for good things in their life. And at times, God deposits his desires so strongly in you that you may think it's your idea and this has happened to me a bunch of times i think man that that was my idea it was like god's in the background going yeah right as dumb as you are sonny but if i didn't help you out right now you ain't gonna make it you know i've been giving you these ideas psalm 37 4 says delight yourself in him it goes back to believing that he exists delight yourself in the lord and he will give you what the desires of your heart and so we have so many desires because the scripture first tells us about our heart. Our heart's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will lead you wrong. So if you delight in the Lord, God will put desires aside here. First off, the devil never gives you a desire that's righteous or good or something that's going to benefit somebody else. So God puts delight. He puts things inside your heart so you delight in him. And it's as if God did it. The revelation that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And I've often said of Abraham, Abraham's name was, was uh, Abraham in the beginning. And God changed his name to Abe. Uh, Abe meant, uh, Abraham's name meant father. Abe meant big daddy. Because his life changed as he moved through life. Verse 12, in cha uh, excuse me, uh, verse 1, chapter 12 says, The Lord had said to Abram, I leave your country. I'm sorry, his name was Abram, then Abraham, a father to Big Daddy. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you will I curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Watch this, verse 4. So Abram left. A revelation demands obedience. When God says to you and you get something in your mind and he speaks to you about first base, he said it's time to go to second base. It's time for you to move. You get a revelation about going into ministry, about starting a business, about relationships, things of that nature, then, then, then you start moving toward that. You've got this understanding. This was a God idea. Amen. So what happens is now I've got to move. God told Abraham, a man who was older in age with no children, that he was going to be a blessing, and he would everybody blessed him, he had blessed. You know why God said that? Because Abraham was God's friend. Who was delighting in the Lord? Abraham. And Abraham being the friend of God, God said, I want to bless this man. Now, he didn't see what God saw. And, and, and in life, again, faith says, I'm seeing something that's not out there. And so he did not see a having a child. He sure didn't see having two children. And we know that one child became the, the, uh, the founding of the Muslim nation, the other the Jewish nation. 
So it was kind of a mess up. Can I get an amen? amen. And it's been a mess up ever since. You know, and we see it in the scripture. People can try to deny it. Muslims can try to deny it. Judah, Judas, uh, Judaism can try to deny it. But it's right here in scripture that you've got an Isaac and an Ishmael. So Isaac was to be born. Second base is confirmation. This is very important. To support or establish the certainty or validity of something. That's confirmation. To support or establish the validity of something. Confirmation is God's way of repeating the promise to you. God will tell you something on first base. And when you get by the time you get to second base, he's repeating it. He's saying it again and again and again. When, whenever I, you know, I've been able to start several churches. Started Crosby Church, started a church in Liberty that's still going on. Some of you may know about a Tuesday night service I had. Uh, that's where I met a guy named Don Nash. Don Nash texted me today and said he's already killed three deer and one hog, and he's going after an elk. I said, sound like you got your quota. Let me tell you something. I don't even think deer season has started yet. I just say that, okay? I just know Don. But, but it was through that, you know, when we started that church, it was a revelation we had. And it was confirmed. I was at a conference, and a man laid hands on me and began to confirm that God would give me. And he even told me where the town was. And that's when we went and started it. When we started the little country church, you know, I wasn't really into doing that at the, at the time. But there was revelation. It would happen. And then the confirmation actually came through you, that you kept coming. And your confirmation was a validation that God was doing something in my life again. And so all that started stirring up, and we started moving in. So we went from first base to second base. It took a little time to get around the bases. Sometimes you've got to wait till somebody else gets a hit. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So you're doing it. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, have that pitcher go, mm -mm, no, not going to pitch that one. You know, you, you don't know what's going on on the other team and things of that nature. So confirmation is very important. God confirmed Abraham three times in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. Again, not to go into those chapters, that's something for you to look at, but God confirmed to him he was going to make him the father of nations. He confirmed it, confirmed it, confirmed it, that there was a promised land, that there was something out there. Now listen, the more important a decision is, or promise revealed, the more confirmation or need to wait on a confirmation is needed. There are certain things in life that really, it's not that important. Uh, should I drink Starbucks today? I'm waiting on this confirmation. If there's a parking spot at the front, I'll know it's the will of God for me to have a latte. <laughs> Last year, David Huff was with us, and Richard was doing his chauffeuring. So Richard is not a Starbucks guy. And so he said, I said, David wants a Starbucks in the morning. He likes those little espressos. That's why David's like this. And so he said, uh, uh, what should I get him? I said, you need to get him a raspberry latte frappuccino espresso vente. I threw all that at him. So Richard went in and asked that very thing. I don't know what they gave you or how, how I got straightened out, but I just gave a big old long name of foolishness that I think Starbucks is personally. So, uh, you know, just making up all them names. Could you just get a cup of coffee and make it a medium, you know, without going through all the vente and the grande and whatever, ate. Okay. So I don't need a lot of confirmation on something that simple. But then there are life-changing decisions you're going to make you. And as you start to make those life-changing decisions, you need confirmation. And you need a very important. So the more important decision is, or a promise revealed, the more confirmations. So you look for them. Confirmations can come through a divine appointment. Can come from somebody coming and just saying something. Sometimes you're going down the freeway and you see a sign. You know, I mean, you see the sign. And you know that's God. It just, you've never seen that sign before. You might have passed a hundred times, all of a sudden now you saw it. Or you may look up in the sky and you just, you know, you had a little dream at night and, and God spoke to you and you, or you think he did and, and, and you, you're going to go start a church and start pastoring and preaching. And you start and you, and, and it, because the next day you got up and you saw an airplane sign in the air and, he, he, and out of the smoke it said G-P-C. And then you thought, okay, that, go preach Christ. And you got up and you fell and flopped and you said, God, what happened? God said, first off, that night that you had that dream, you had two bologna sandwiches before you went to bed. <laughs> Second, that wasn't GPC for you. That wasn't go, go preach Christ. I was trying to tell a farmer to go plant corn. <laughs> Everybody with me here? So you've got to pay attention and really get confirmation. You've got to walk through it and say, I don't know how important it is. Now, I want everybody say second base. Second That's base. important. This is when the peace of God leads you. Because you're there now. You don't pass first. You don't, get, you don't get to go back to first after you get to second. Have you ever seen a guy get on second base, the pitcher pitches a pitch, and you decide, you know what, I'm going back to first. 
I'm just going to go back over here. First base is a lot more comfortable. You know, it's closer to the dugout. You know, it's just a whole lot easier to be over here. You don't get to do that. You made the turn. You're on second. Now you're at confirmation. So God is confirming some things to you. What you need to do now is to head toward third. And when you head toward third base, that's confession. Everybody say confession. It simply means to agree with God. I'm going to agree with God on this. Finally, I'm in a place in my life I want to agree. This is a time the promise revealed and confirmed in your heart must be announced from your mouth. It's when you start confessing. It's confessing Christ as Savior. Revelation, I know God exists. First base. Second base, confirmation. Everything in my life tells me it's time to start serving God and quit being an idiot. Okay? So then I confess Christ as my Lord and Savior. I just moved to third base. I'm moving on down. I got confession. I'm sharing. So I want to get home. You know, in home, we'll talk about that in a minute. But confession is so important. This is the time the promise revealed comes out of your mouth. Hebrews 11, verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. And remember, God said, I'm going to tell you to go to a place you've never heard of, never been. Uh, a mountain that I will show you. Where is Mount I'll show you? And you know his life. When he took Isaac to Mount Moriah, he didn't know he was going to Moriah. He didn't know where he was going. He just grabbed the boy, grabbed some, some wood, grabbed some fire, and headed out to sacrifice. Be Why? Because he had faith in God. Amen. Because faith is what's going to get us home. By faith, Abraham was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. His own boys lived in tents too, who were, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Isn't that what we're doing? By faith, we're looking for the great architect and the builder and the city, the kingdom of God. This place where Jesus said and gave us a little hint in John 14, where he said, I go away and prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. In my father's hacienda are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Isn't that what he's talking about, that, that great city in the sky, that tremendous place of what God is, whose architect and builder is God? Ma Abraham was looking for that. He made, see, the promised land was not heaven. The promised land has giants in it. You know, some people preach the promised land, and they sing songs. I've heard southern gospel songs that make the promised land sound like we're going to heaven. The pro I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? You know, uh, over Jordan was the promised land. But the bottom line to all of that, it's still it, it's here on earth. This is where we're facing the giants. This is where we're dealing with the big things. Amen. When we get to heaven, there's no more giants. There's nothing to, to, to be afraid of. So he was looking even beyond that. And then home run, to get home. To you get excited when somebody gets to first base. That's nice. Revelation. Then they see that confirmation to slide into second base and the tag was missed and you're there. And then to get to... I'm sorry, that's confession and uh, confirmation, then confession, and you get there. You know, that's great. Guy on third, man, this could be good. But to see somebody slide home, it wasn't his last game, but the game when Altuve came home, and, he, and he, he looked like a little kid going down a slide. And the picture of him like this, he's smiling, and he's sliding in, and he's, you can just see the glee on his face because we won the game. It was crazy. Pandemonium, man. It, was, it, was, it shouldn't have happened because it was in L.A., and yet we, we stole that second game. And I thought, man, this is great. This is the way heaven's going to be. When we slide into home, when we finally get there, amen, to, to go in knowing that we gave everything we had here, manifestation, the moment when the promise revealed, confirmed, and confessed becomes reality in the natural realm. Hebrews 11, 11 says, By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father. That's a home run. Because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. It started out with a revelation. But then we saw the manifestation after the confirmation and the confession. And he has his son by the name of Isaac. Romans 4.21 says, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. God promised something. That's a revelation. So in this life, as I close, I'm telling you, as we move through the bases in life, and as you move through it, ask yourself, okay, is this a real revelation that I've got hold of here? Or is this some kind of craziness? It should line up with the Word of God. And then as you move through life, start looking for confirmation that God confirms His Word to you. He's going to start confirming it through the mouths of others. And again, validation is a powerful thing. 
when somebody confirms that, we, that you're doing the right thing. It, it, it also, validation, doesn't it help us? Doesn't it strengthen you when somebody appreciates what you're doing and validates that, that you know, you are a drummer or you are a musician or you, you are a servant, you are doing the right thing? Those are powerful things that take place. Philippians tells us that faith will get us home. Paul said, and I've got to remind you again and again, to the best of our knowledge, Paul was in his mid to late 40s. And that at the end of his life, when he felt like this was over, he ran to a assassination, or not assassination, I'd call it a murder. But he ran to give his head up over a chopping block. Yeah, come out of the cell. Move quickly. You can't, you can't defeat a guy like that who's, who's ready to go. The scripture says no greater love than this than for a, a man or woman to lay down his life for his brother or sister. When I, I, I dwelt on that scripture this week because somebody asked me about it. And they were asking me about suicide. And I said, well, you know, not all suicides are wrong. Sometimes someone would throw themselves on a hand grenade or push somebody out of the way and take the hit from a vehicle. You know, no greater love than this than for a person to lay down their life for someone else. And then I dwelt on it some more, and I realized that love was greater than life. That no greater love than this than one to lay down his life. When Jesus died for us, it was the love he had for his Father, the love he had for his Father's creation that he was a part of in the beginning, in the big inning. Amen. And here he was laying down his life because he loved and I don't mean this mean, but sometimes we try to hold on to life too strong when we ought to be just loving a little bit more, caring a little bit more for people. And then let God have his way with our, these uh, earth suits that we have. Let him deal with that. Philippians tells us, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. But Paul said, I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. I press on. I'm moving first base, second. I'm rounding the bases in life. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I'm doing, I'm forgetting what is behind. And I'm straining. I'm pressing. I'm, 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 I'm pushing toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know, tonight our baseball team is pressing on. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, it was four to nothing after the first inning the other night. And I thought, well, yeah, it's over. Who's up? We? Are we up? Okay, that's good. Thank you, Marie, for the play-by-play. -play. The, the thing is this. Now you've messed me up. When he says here that God has called me heavenward, I press on toward the goal to win. Why are you going to play a sport if it's not to win? I think the worst thing we ever did was make all our kids winners. Psst, you're not a winner. You lost. Look at the scoreboard. You know, you played a good game, but you lost a game. And we try to pacify, and, and you know, all we've done is turn our kids into <laughs> little sissies. And so it's important in life, I think, to, to win if you're going to compete. Win. To do the best you can. And also learn this. Learn how to lose. Deal with it when you lose. That's just here on earth, you know. But, but Paul said, look, I'm pressing to win this thing. I want to come across the plate. I, I, want, to, I, I want to take this thing. When you take the winning and the losing out, particularly the human element in our life, it does make life mundane. It doesn't do anything for me. You know, as, as our college football starts winding down, I'd hate to think, well, well you know what, we're, gonna, we're just going to put anybody that wants in there and we're going to give everybody the same trophy. Well, then all the work that some of the teams have done would be for naught, you know? So it would be useless. In this life, Paul said run to win. So we win. We're going around the base. But in, I'm asking God to give you revelation. Life ain't over here on this earth. And then to start confirming what he gave you. And start using the mouths of people. And you can use all kinds of things. And then you confess. You know what God's doing in my life? The hardest thing for me was to start one more time saying, I'm going to pastor the little country church. Because many years ago, I was in Redding, California. And there was a church called the little country church. I confess. I stole the name. But it had been in my spirit. I preached in a church there, and it was right next to the little country church. And I looked at that church, and I thought, who would name that church the little country church? And this thing was huge. And I thought, 
I just like that. It ain't a little bitty white building. This was a big building called the Little Country. I don't even know if it's still there. And, and I looked at that, and I thought, I like it. And it stayed in my spirit. You know, there was two things that stayed in my spirit, a fellowship of believers and the Little Country Church. And then later, the revelation of Holy Wild. Holy Wild was the first base thing for me. Who ever thought of Hol Holy Wild? Now, I, I preach that, and people look at me like, this guy's a nutcase. You can't do this. In, this ain't Bible. And then I proved it to you with the Word of God. Then I had confirmation. Then a guy wrote a book called Holy Wild. And I thought, you rascal. But it's okay. And then I took that, and, and then I got into wave walking, and I started seeing more confirmation. And, and, re, and, you know, and then, then we moved into uh, confession and confessing it. And then God gave us the church. And the rest is kind of history now after 14 years. So this is how life is. So when you get revelation, and sometimes it's almost embarrassing. I think we confess too early. When, when God told Abraham, you're going to have a child, he said, oh, 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 yeah, right. It was a revelation. Evidently, Sarah didn't get it because the Bible says she laughed at him. There ain't nothing more humiliating for a man, especially in the area of reproduction, for a woman to laugh at him when he's trying to do something to help have the child. Uh, you, do I need to get any deeper into this? Y'all good with all that? Okay. So I really hurt for Abraham. At that moment, I was hurting for the man when I'm reading that. But as the scripture goes on, by faith, he, he, he did the right thing here, and he pressed in. Hallelujah. And then there was a child. And then was, I'm sure when, when she was six months pregnant, Abraham went around and started confessing. We're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby, Joseph. Joseph going to have a baby. Skylar going to have a baby. She's going to do all the work. <laughs> Amen. But they always say, we're going to have it. So you start confessing it. You know? And that's a great joy as we're moving them through the basis. I hope you learned something tonight. We're going to gather in the fellowship hall, those that like to stay. You know, I think there's popcorn and there's drinks. And Dennis got our TV up and running so we can go watch that hell of vision and uh, cheer on the... I, mean, I remember those days. If you had a TV, and I, I preached a lot of Pentecostals, and they were funny. If you had a TV, they called it a hell of vision, and you're all going to hell for having it. And yet, they had, they had uh, computer monitors hid in their closet so that they could watch stuff. It was a loophole. As long as they had a monitor, they were fine, but you couldn't have a television. Oh, come on. How hypocritical. Let's stand. Everybody say press on. We want, to make, we want to make this thing all the way around. And tonight, I wanted to make this good for you. I know a lot of folk did. They, they stayed to watch the game. They, and Halloween's out there. It's not my favorite day. That's why you don't hear me. The last time I dressed up for Halloween, do y'all remember? I came as a preacher. Yeah, I'd put on a suit and shaved. Everybody said, why are you, what, what did you can I put on a tie? Showed up as a preacher. Yeah. I think Jennifer showed up as me. Yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> She put a beard on and a bandana and a, <laughs> and a jacket. I mean, this is crazy. Even hey, Judah was about this tall. He showed up as a, as a, a turtle, you know. Uh, but I just this day has never been one of those great big days for me other than because I, I want to celebrate the resurrection. I want to celebrate his birth, you know. This day right here can be a little twisted if you're not careful. Amen. Hey, take this word tonight. Get on base. Start moving. Hope you wrote it down. I've been re reviewing it in my own spirit. Amen. I, I tell you, it's going to be faith that's going to get us home. You're going to have to have faith to get to heaven. You've got to have faith to keep walking this earth. Amen? Amen. Father, I love you. I thank you for your people. I ask your heart to be, yeah, that our hearts would be knit toward your heart, that we would delight ourselves in you, and you would give us to the desires of our heart. And, God, that you would move us from base to base. God, we give you praise for this night. Now, Lord, I pray for protection security for our children and, and our children's children. Lord, as they're out tonight and they're, they're all over the country, well, our families are spread all over the place. So keep your hand upon them. Lord, I pray for the, for the wickedness known as uh, ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda and those who, who are preying on the innocent by taking vehicles and things and hitting. God, I pray for those families. Lord, the devastation of that. I pray you slay the wicked, God, that if, if they're not going to convert and turn around, God, you just send them straight to hell in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.